Other Davies companies are still coming. Uh, so uh, Oracle is giving a tech talk on campus this Wednesday. Uh, I think this guy is from the in-memory database group. It's from the same group as Shashank uh, Chopin, who came in, uh, gave, gave a guest lecture in, in the intro class last semester. Um, so he's going to come talk about, I suspect it would be very, a similar talk than what we got uh, last semester. But that's at 4.30 over here in, in New Simon. Um, there'll probably be pizza for this, because if it's at 4.30, then there's usually pizza, right? The 12 o'clock ones, unless it's on a Thursday, uh, there's usually not food. Anyway. All right, so before we get started, uh, Matt posted on Piazza last night on uh, the speeds for project one uh, that you need, need to target, and then he'll be setting up Gradescope today so you can submit that. So again, what'll happen is you'll submit your, uh, your project on Gradescope. Uh, that'll just prove that it actually builds, and then we'll have to run these offline on the same EC2 instance that, uh, that, that, you know, that we're telling you to when we do grading. Uh, somebody posted on Piazza last night that like the if you use the instance store of the instance type we give you, then it runs out of space. This is because we do static linking in our system. So when you build everything, like every single test case is like one gig, so you run out of space. Um, there's no way to build the benchmarks without building the tests. Um, but it might be if you just if you just target the like building the slot iterator, it may not actually build all the unit tests. It may just build that one binary, so you should still be okay. But there's no way to like, you can do pass a flag and say in CMake, turn off building benchmarks. You can also turn off building the test, but you cur that's currently broken because there's some dependency be between the two of them. Okay? So any high level questions about project one? Okay, and we'll, again, we'll try to answer our own Piazza as, as, the, as the week progresses. Okay? All right, so we've spent the last couple weeks talking about sort of uh, more o OLTP aspects of a database system. So we talked about how to do transactions, we all talked about how to do indexes, uh, and now we're gonna go at the bottom uh, layer of the database system, and now talk about storage. And then going forward for the rest of the semester, we'll start building up new layers on top of that. So we'll do database storage, then we'll do uh, execution, query optimization, and so forth. Um, and so the, the, the reason why I started with transactions and indexes first, because in the back of your mind, as we go forward, when we discuss other aspects of the database system, you should be thinking about this in the context of an MVCZ system, and then think about whether whatever, you know, whatever technique or method we're discussing, would this actually work for if you're doing MVCC? And some things work great if they're, if they're single version, some things not so great uh, when they're multi-version. So that, that's sort of why I, I front-loaded the transactional stuff in the beginning. All right, so this is the chart I showed in the, in the beginning of the semester of what a, at a high level, what an in-memory database actually looks like. So say we have now our index, our BW tree, our, our index doesn't matter. Um, we're going to do a lookup to find a, a given tuple. And then this thing is going to spit out a block ID and an offset. So the block ID could just be a pointer to the beginning of the block, and the offset could be within that block. Uh, but that would sort of be kind of wasteful. The, the, this thing could just be just a straight pointer to the tuple itself. Um, but now you get into issues if you start move, moving things around. So in our system, what we actually do, and a student came up with this and it was pretty clever, we use a trick uh, from C++11 called align as. And basically this is telling the compiler in the system to align the starting address of a memory block at, at a certain offset. So we do this where we have all our blocks are one megabytes, and we use align as to enforce this. So now the block ID offset we get is a 44-bit pointer to some one megabyte block and then we have 20 bits now to jump into some region. So instead of having an extra indirection layer to say, how do I get my, from my block ID to a, to a block address, right? we can pack this all in, in a single thing. The only reason I bring this up is because in the old system in Peloton, it was a train wreck. This thing would actually be a pointer to a pointer. So we had a thing called a tuple pointer pointer, and that was, it became a nightmare. We had so many layers of indirection, where now this one just tells you exactly how to go to the block ID, uh, and then, or the block, block location, and then this is just the offset to it. So again, the main thing to point out though is that all of our tuples are going to, we're going to try to store these fixed length uh, uh, contiguous pieces of memory. Whether it's a column store or a row store, it doesn't matter. 
these values need to be fixed length because then, then we can do this arithmetic uh, very, very easily to say, oh, I want the fifth tuple. I know the size of every tuple in my block. I know how to jump to the starting location for that tuple. Anything that could be variable length will inst or inst instead store it in a separate data pool uh, where we have variable length data blocks. And this sort of looks like what malloc does underneath the covers. Right? It's a bin packing problem trying to s stick in uh, you know, m different regions of memory of different sizes. Right? And so this would just be now a 64-bit pointer to that location. So this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about like, how we're actually going to represent stuff in here and then stuff in here. So um, at a high level, what you can think of what an in-memory database just is, it's just, it's just a large byte array. We malloc a bunch of chunks of memory, and then we need a way to now interpret those chunks or regions of, the, uh, of those memory chunks to infer what the schema actually is. So because we're a relational databases, uh, we're told the schema ahead of time. JSON stuff is usually just treated as a variable, variable length data. Um, but we know like I have these number of columns, I can have these types and, and these sizes. So now when we jump to an offset in that fixed length uh, data pool, we know that this is the starting location of a tuple and we know how to interpret the bytes that we're looking at. We know whether to interpret it as, as an integer or a float or, or, or you know, a timestamp. So, Again, we already talked about this before. Every tuple is going to be prefixed with a header that includes the metadata, such as visibility. We'll talk about nulls, sticking that in there. But basically, when I jump to an offset to say this is the starting location of the tuple, I'm really jumping into the header. And I can look at that header and try to figure out you know, what's going to come after that. We're not going to store any of the schema information in the header, because that'd be wasteful to do that for every single tuple. The JSON databases that are schemaless have to do this. Uh, but in our world, we, you know, every tuple has to have the same, same, same structure, the same layout. And so we don't need to re repeatedly store that in the header. So all right, today we're going to talk about doing type representation. How do we actually represent individual uh, elements or attributes in a tuple? Then we'll build up on top of that and talk about how we lay out now those attributes for a single tuple. Then we'll talk about different storage models. And then if we have time, we'll finish up and talk about uh, system catalogs. Because again, like, this is sort of like an additional stuff that I want you guys to sort of be aware of. And this is actually kind of cool things that you can do uh, with, because you have a relational catalog, a relational database with, with the schema. But the, 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 so the bulk of the main, main material we want to focus on is storage models and, and above. Okay? So the, this is the same, uh, I've, I've shown this before in the intro class, but basically we know all the types uh, that our database system can support. The SQL standard specifies what the, the basic types are. Um, and we know then now how, how to actually represent the bits to, rep, you know, to, to for each individual at, uh, value of an attribute. So for integers, big ints, small ints, tiny ints, we're just going to use what C or C++ pr uh, provides for us when we say allocate like an int 32 or int 64 or, or small int. Uh, there's nothing special there. We just take whatever the bits we are when we allocate that you know, variable like that, and that's what we're storing uh, in our database. For uh, floating point numbers, we'll have this distinction between floats and reals. Floats and reals are just going to be using the IEEE 754 standard which is telling you at the hardware how we're going to represent floating point numbers. But this is going to have rounding and inaccuracy issues. And then there's the fixed point decimals, the numerics and decimal types that are specified in the SQL standard. Every database system is free to implement this any way they want. Uh, some are more efficient than others. The Oracle one is better than the Postgres one. Um, but the main idea is that this, this doesn't have the same rounding errors that you have in the floating point numbers. Timestamps, dates, uh, and times, types, these also vary per implementation. I don't, the SQL standard doesn't specify how you actually represent uh, these type of attributes, but they do specify how, you know, what kind of operations you can do on them. Like, can, can I add two times together, or can I subtract them? Things like that. Uh, one common approach is just to use the, the Unix uh, epoch. So it's the number of seconds or milliseconds since the uh, January 1st, 1970. And you use that to calculate what is, what, what is the current date and time. Uh, in C++, there's this thing called time spec, which gives you a uh, time offset and then uh, nanosecond offset, and that's actually 16 bytes larger than this. In our current system, I think we're using 64-bit 60, uh, 64-bit integers, which is the millisecond since the Unix epoch. But again, from a C for the SQL level, you don't know and you don't care. You just know you have timestamps. You can stick things in, and you, you can do comparisons on them. For the var chars, var binaries, text, and, and variable length fields, again, in the fixed length portion of the tuple, we'll store a pointer to some block of data in the variable length um, pool. If the value that we're trying to store is going to be less than 64, uh, greater than 64 bits, right? If the size of the data we're storing is smaller than the pointer, 
then we might as well just store the data rather than have a pointer to that data. Anything larger than that, then we'll store it in a very linked data pool, and we'll keep some extra metadata to keep track of like what are we looking at, and if it overflows to another data pool, we, we have pointers to those as well. So I'll cover that uh, as we go along. So uh, this quickly, I'm going to talk about the difference between variable precision and floating point precision uh, decimal numbers. So again, if you go for a float, a real, or a double, you're going to get the hardware representation of a decimal or floating point number. Right? And that's specified by this 754 standard that every single PC or every single uh, CPU has to follow. So if you store a floating point number on a power uh, CPU, it'll be represented the same way in x86. The andiness might be switched, like the bit order might be switched, but at, at the sort of you know, how you keep track of the decimal point and what's before and after it, it's all specified by this. So this will be really fast because uh, the hardware is actually going to have, you know, low level instruction support to take, you know, two floating point numbers and compare them or add them, add them together. It's not going to be as fast potentially as doing addition on, on integers, uh, but it's certainly going to be faster than doing anything that we can manage ourselves in the database system. But the downside again is you're going to have rounding errors. So if you write a really simple C program like this, where you take two numbers, uh, two 32-bit flo floating numbers, uh, 0 0.1 and 0 0.2, if I add them together, you would think the answer would be 0 0.3. But the problem is when you actually start looking at what, what's, what's, you know, what, 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 different positions in the decimal, you see you end up with all sorts of weird stuff because, again, the, the hardware can't, can't precisely store 0 0.3. So even just you know, print out 0 0.3, you, you get a bunch of, bunch of stuff. So this, again, for some aspects in, um, in applications, this is fine. Maybe this is OK. Like if I'm storing you know, the, 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 the temperature of this room, I don't need to have you know, a super accurate measurement, right? You know, 98.6 or 90.0 is, is like good enough. But if I'm dealing with like money or anything that's like scientific measurements, right, I don't want these flat, uh, rounding errors then I want to use fixed point decimal numbers. And the idea here is that the database system itself is going to keep track of what is the, what is the exact value that we're trying to store, and it handles all the rounding errors or all other issues uh, that can come up when you start doing multiplication and manipulation. So the, this is actually what I'm saying here is inaccurate. So this is actually what Postgres does. What Postgres does will store the decimal point number essentially as a var char, like a, like a string, and then they have some extra metadata to keep track of, like, where is the decimal point? Is it negative or positive? What are some rounding issues? So they have these giant, like, switch statements to deal with all these different variations of the type of operations you want to do. And it runs about twice as slow than the uh, floating point numbers. The hyper guys have a, uh, a low-level uh, sort of bit manipulation method to distorting uh, fixed point decimals that is very, very efficient. And actually, some cases can run faster than the, the floating point numbers, which I don't know how that is possible, but that, this is what they show us. So uh, I'm not going to have time to teach that. I don't fully understand what they're doing just yet. The, the German guy recommended this book called Hacker's Delight uh, that sh tells you how to do all this little, little bit manipulation. But if this is something you want to pursue for Project 3, then we should talk. Um, yes? I was going to say, I think uh, you know, with like banks, they use like four bits and then just use that to represent a single decimal. Like, it's like instead of using 16, they'll just go like more than 10. Uh, for for like, a, like a single decimal position, mm -hmm. only four bits. Yeah, four bits. These like really old CPUs. So oh, like, okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, that, that I don't know anything about. I know that like um, for the banks, they never overwrite data. So like if there's like if a rounding issue could occur because the way their application was written, when you computed like interest or something like that. You could always go back and fix it by you know, rerunning the computation again. So it's not like you would lose that, you'd lose any data by having imprecise precision. I don't know what I, I don't. This is something I'm very interested in, a lot, very interested in, but I don't know enough about it to like, opine whether you know what people are actually doing. Other than I know the Germans have solved it, but I don't know exactly what they're doing yet. I don't fully understand it. Okay. Again, this, if this is something you want to do for Project Three. I'd be happy to try to help out with this, and I'll you know point to the chapter in the book uh, that that he recommended. Okay. So, uh, the, as I said, like, again, the, the database is essentially just a byte array. Uh, which is just going to be, you know, a char array or, or byte array. And then now we need to now put, start putting meaning onto what the bits we're storing in these bytes. So say I have a simple table here, has two fields, ID as a 32-bit integer, and that's the primary key, and then value is a 64-bit integer. 
So the layout of the tuple would look like this, right? I have my header of some size where I'm storing the, you know, the timestamps and everything that we talked about before. And then when the header ends, now I have the ID field. And when that ends, now I have the value field, right? So if I need now in my, in my database system, I want to understand, like I need to read, you know, this field, right? I know how to find the location of this tuple, right? Because that's, the index got me there. The, all the headers will be of the same size. So I know how to then jump past that. And at this position here, then everything I read afterwards for up to 32 bits will be the ID field. So how do we actually access this data when it's just you know, in, our, in our C code or C++ code, we just see a bunch of byte array. We need a way to convert this into something that we can, we can interpret as a 30-bit integer. Let me take a guess how you do that in C++. Reinterpret cast, right? So all that's going to say now, and this is a compiler constru construct. This is going to say, like, all right, when I read this memory address, treat whatever you're reading as not a byte array, but a 32-bit uh, integer. So that now in the compiler, it knows that when it, when it accesses, it's just going to access just those 32 bits. Right? So now for the variable length data, say I have a, a, a var char 1024. So again, in the fixed length data array, I have my header, and then I have the 64-bit the pointer. And this is going to now point to now down to some memory region here in the variable length data pool, the starting location that's going to tell me, you know, to find the actual value that I want. So in this case here, for each of these uh, entries in the variable length data pool, it'll have its own header that keeps track of what is the length of the data that we're storing contiguously for this chunk. And then if it overflows this chunk, there'll be a next pointer that jumps down to some other memory location where we can, we can read the rest of the data, right? So this is not unique to in-memory databases. The, the, the disk-based databases do the same thing. If, you're, if, you're, if your var chart or text field overflows between different pages, right, you, need, you need a way to how to connect these all together. The other thing that I, I didn't, I'm not going to talk about uh, too much uh, is that this is, gonna be, this is not going to be null terminated, typically, because otherwise you're, you're, you know, you're wasting a byte for no, you know, for no reason. So in our code, we can't just go to call like, you know, string compare or string length in, in our, in, in, I'll add the C library to compare this thing because it's not going to have a, a you know, null at the end. So it's not truly a C string. So we have to write some additional, uh, you know, we have to write our own string functions to be able to interpret this thing and understand it. OK? The other optimization we can do here is that, say, you know, say I'm trying to look up, you know, find me all the, the strings, uh, the, val the values where the beginning of the string starts with the word Andy. So how would I have to do that? And, and with this setup, I would have to scan through my table and then for every single tuple, follow this pointer to some, some random location and then jump, you know, you know, jump it to the first you know, some bytes and see whether it starts with Andy. So that would be really expensive to do because there'd be a lot of indirection, a lot of, uh, a lot of branch misprediction because uh, there's no conditionals. But it, it basically, I'd be scanning one part of memory, then jumping over to another part, and then going back and scanning more and back and forth. Right, so I would have bad cache locality because it's not like I can keep scanning the same, you know, a bunch of stuff that I brought into my caches all at once. I got to keep jumping over and over again. So a really simple optimization is actually to pad out the uh, the pointer portion that you're storing in the fixed length data to include a prefix of the string down below. So now when I scan across and try to find things that start with Andy, I can just look at this thing and see whether it matches or not, and I never have to even touch any of this. So we act, so this hyper does this, and we actually do this in our own system. So the the pointer portion of, of a varlen field in the fix, fixed length data pool will, is going to be 16 bytes or 128 bits. So we store 64 bit pointer to the actual data, and then we use the remaining 64 bits to store uh, prefix. You could also store a hash of the entire string, right? There's di there's different methods to do that you could use. Okay. All right, so now, all right, so now we know how to store basic uh, scalar, or scalar values of fixed length values, integers, floats, and timestamps. Now we know how to store, store uh, very length data. Now the last thing we've got to deal with is nulls. So there's three ways to do nulls, at least as far as I know. The first approach is to just designate a special value in the domain of a type in the database to represent null. So one thing you could do is say the smallest 32-bit integer you could ever store, which is defined in libc as n32min, like this pound defined. 
that will be null. So if I ever see this value when I'm looking at a tuple, then I'm going to treat that as a null, not really n32 min. So now up above in, in the above the storage layer in the database system, you have to account for this. Like if someone tries to insert this value, you have to throw you know throw an exception, throw an error because they're you know if they try to store this value and then you read it back and it says it's you know it's null, then that would sort of be confusing. So you basically have a bunch of extra uh, boundary code up above to make sure that this this is considered out of range. So uh, we did this in HStore and VoltDB. Uh, we did this, uh, MoneyDB, MoneyDB does the same thing, and then we originally were doing this in, in Peloton. Uh, in the old data system we were building here at CMU. Um, but as far as I know, other than MoneyDB and VoltDB, they're the only two ones that I know that does this. The more common approach is to use a, uh, a null column bitmap. So we're going to now do and store in our header for our tuple, we're going to have this bitmap field that's going to say for every single attribute that I have in my tuple, the bit is set to 1 if that attribute is null. So if I have 1,000 attributes or per tuple, then I have to have my bitmap be a, have, have 1,000 entries. So now as I'm scanning the tuple and, and, and applying predicates, I do a lookup in this thing to see whether the attribute I'm looking at is, you know, is that bit set to true? And if so, then it's null. So this one is way more common, both for in-memory databases and disk databases, like MySQL, Postgres, SQL Server, Oracle, everybody does it this way. And this is what we now do in our own system. Because now we're also a column store, uh, this is just now not, we're not storing this bitmap per tuple. We just have a, for, you know, for a single column, here's the whole bitmap for every single tuple that's in, in a block. All right, the last one is, uh, I'll just say it front. I think this one's stupid. Um, only one database I know that does this, and that's MemSQL. And this is where you're going to store for every single attribute that's in your tuple, you're going to have a, a separate flag to say whether it's null or not. So if I have a 32-bit integer that could be null, then I need a little flag in front of it that says, uh, that, you know, is this thing null or not? So why is this stupid? Yes? It ruins your offsets. It says it ruins your offsets. No, wait, everyone has the same flag, then, then the offsets are fine. Yeah, like, essentially, using, say, your 32-bit integer is now 33 bits. Okay. Uh, everything is like slightly off going the whole way around. You can't just jump right to your thing. You have to jump and then like go over and then reinterpret. You can't like... No, no, it's, it's no, that's not an issue, right? Instead of, if, like, if I have four attributes and everyone is 32 bits plus one bit for the flag, then if I want the third attribute, I take 33 times three and I jump to where I need to go. But you don't have a bit addressable memory, right? Bingo, that's it. He says you don't have a bit addressable memory. So you can't, again, a 32-bit integer just can't make it 33 bits because that's going to make everything unaligned, and you can't access memory at, a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at bit offsets. You can do byte offsets. So if you go now look at the, the MemSQL documentation, they say what's the size of all the different data types they support. So this is from MemSQL 6. Um, I recently looked, I, you know, this, is, this, this chart from the documentation is maybe like two years old, but recently looked and they're still doing this. So, for every single int, or every single data type, a fixed, fixed size data type, they're going to have two potential sizes. They'll have the size of its, if it could be null, and the size of it's not null. <laughs> so if you just take Boolean, right? Boolean is true or false. So that's, you store that as, as one byte, because we can't store single bits. So if it could be null, then I have to store two bytes. Right? Same for the other ones, right? And it's, it's like, for tiny ints, it's double in size, doubles in size. This one, they get by just adding a single byte uh, to make something, um, actually, no, take that. Medium, or medium bit is, sorry, medium bit is three bytes, so they add a single byte. For, for int and big int, they have to have four bytes, because that's how you have to do cache, uh, how you do word alignment in, in x86. So, like, again, if I store now, uh, if you think of, like, the bitmap case, or in the, going back here, this is the smallest one to store, because you don't take any extra space, you have to store the attribute anyway, and just using this extra one to say, oh, this, this is null. This gets a little bit larger, because now I have to have a single bit for every single uh, attribute in my, my tuple. But at least in that case, it's just a bit, and I only need to pad out the bitmap a little, uh, just a little bit. Right? This one is, for every single attribute, I have to pad it out. Yes? So like, what is null being used for in this instance? Is it just like a gravestone marker, or is it like... What is null being used? What do you mean? Like, I mean, like, yeah, like, is it just, like, simply saying, like, because I know, like, if you delete something, you might just put a null in there instead of... 
No, I mean, so in SQL, you can have, it's a three type value system. So I can have a value and I can set it like true, false, or null. And null means unknown. I don't know what the value is. But how do you know that they are using these extra values only for the null? Maybe they have some. Because they're telling you size, well, I see. What you mean. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they may have some. Yes. Values. So his point. Thing that they, else okay, so his point is correct. I, I, we should, I, yes, I agree with you. What his statement is, oh, am I just looking at this and saying, oh, well, you're using this extra two bytes just to store null, or are they doing our varchar trick and storing some extra crap in there? Yeah. But what the hell would you actually store for a single attribute, right? Like, <laughs> right? Like, and for these fixed line types, like any, like, I can imagine like in a varchar, like. Say I like my, my example where I padded out, where like I showed the prefix, I showed you the hash, I could store maybe the size up there, so I'm looking for things of a certain size. Yes, there's things I could store that, that you that you want to be would be potentially materialize expensive to materialize for a varchar. Any operation I could do on these things for on a single attribute, psh, that's gonna be you know, super fast. Like you could say, all right, well maybe they're also now storing. When you, I mean, for any of these, you can't. There's not not if you if you need that bit. To store something as, as as potentially null, like say I'm gonna sort of like this would be stupid, like the, the 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 negation of the absolute value of something. First of all, that's cheap to compute, right? That's a few instructions, but I wouldn't be able to store that in this anyway because I still need to store that null flag. So I don't I don't know what they could be pre-computing. And everything is 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 aligned. Now, I was MemSQL put out a new version of their column store. I should double check to see whether that. Like early or late last year, they might have fixed this, but but I don't know. They're the only ones I know that does that does this or did this. Yes. Uh, what's the bit data type? Why is it bit? Oh, his question is, what's a bit data type and why is it uh, eight bytes? That is a good question. I don't know. <laughs> or nine bytes? Is it like just storing like raw bit data? Stick it Let's go find out. Um, this is not a good use of our time, but. Um, <laughs> I, I, it's probably like a bit field, or maybe it's a bitmap. Bit SQL type. Bit data type is an integer data type that can be taken value of 0, 1, or null. SQL server system has one byte. All right. I don't know. That's a good question. Yes. Because SQL servers get stored as, as, as expected. Okay. Let's look at that up later. Okay. All right. Um, so again, this is the most common one. This is what we do now. There's some other optimizations we can do now on our bitmap uh, because everything is contiguous. Like if I'm saying, try, find, me all the, the, find me all the tuples where this value is null, then I can just take this bitmap uh, if, if it's stored as a column store. So all for a single attribute, I have... I have a single bitmap and all contiguous, and now I can do like symbi operations or vectorized operations to do counts and other things more quickly, right? Where everything, these two guys, you have to still have to look at, look at the attribute. Okay, so let's understand now why, the deeper, why they have to do this padding out, right? And he, he's already sort of said it, right? Because of alignment issues, because you can't access things at like, you know, funky, you know, 33 bit offsets, right? So what I'm gonna describe to you now is I do cache line word alignment for our, our tuples in our database. But I'm actually going to be telling you uh, this or using examples with 64 bit words or 64 bit cache lines. In a real x86, the cache line is 64 bytes. But for simplicity and to make everything fit on a slide, I'm going to use 64 bits as an example. Okay? So just understand the high level composite is the same, just the, 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 the length of what the cache line is will be different. So let's say now I have a table here. Right? I have four attributes, an int, a timestamp, a char2, and, uh, and a zip code. In the case of a char versus varchar, some systems actually will store the varchar, any, some systems will store a char just as, as a regular varchar, but in actuality, if you say, well, I know it can only be ever two bytes, then you can store that exactly uh, uh, in the fixed length data pool, a fixed length uh, tuple slot. Right? So again, here's our alignments. We're, we're assuming we have 64-bit 64, 64 words. So now when I start writing out this uh, data to our, to our tuple, right, I, this, the ID is 32 bits, the timestamp is 64 bits, then this color is, is, is 2 bytes or 16 bits, and then I have my zip code, right? So now let's say I do a query, I want to do a lookup on 
the, the, the date field. Again, I do my arithmetic. I know what the schema is. So I know what these, the size of these attributes are. I know how to do that simple math to jump to my offset and, and now read this. But what's going to happen here? What happens if, I, if my processor reads something that's not word aligned? Bring the whole cache line to cache. Is it, well, he says, he says, bring the whole cache line to, ca to cache reads. Yeah. That's one. What else could it do? Someone else could come in and write into it. Like, when you read the first half, so you get torn right or something. So he says, well, yeah, so that's also an issue. We're not going to worry about that. He says that someone else could come in and write to the other half, and I only see the first half. Let's assume that we have transaction protection above that. We're not, we're not, that, that won't be an issue. There's no, no two writers. So there's actually three things could happen. So they got the first one, right? And this is actually what x86 will do and the newer versions of ARM will do. So the, in their world with x86, they're trying to make you as the programmer's life as e easy as possible. So if you try to read something that's not word aligned, they'll do it, the, the multiple reads for you and then stitch the, 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 the value back together and hand it back to your program. Because now, as we said, that's going to be slow because what should have been just one read into memory is, or, in, or you know, into our CPU caches is now going to be two reads. Right? So we're, we're going to bring a bunch of extra crap that we actually don't need. Like if we just needed to get uh, the, this date field, we're, in, we're going to have to bring in this ID field and the um, you know, portion of the zip code and this, this, this char array even though we only just wanted those 32 bits. So we're going to read 128 bits just to read 32 bits, right? And that's bad. We don't want to do that. So for this one, uh, you, under perf, you can tell it to, uh, one of the events you can record are uh, unaligned accesses. And actually, we run with the ASAN stuff from Google when, when you run uh, our test cases. So if you do unaligned uh, uh, memory access, like, it'll throw an error and say you can't do that. But you can also use perf to take a binary and run it and count the number of unaligned accesses that you have. And that can help explain why your program is running slow. Call grind is not going to give you that because call grind only sees what, what, like, what instructions you execute right, and what lines of code. It doesn't tell you like, what the hardware actually did. The other approach would be uh, to do random reads. Basically, you're just get some random combination of, uh, of data. And you have to, then as a program, have to figure this out on your own. Right? This is obviously way faster than this. This is also easier to engineer on the actual chip because you're not doing extra stuff to make, to, to reassemble things. This is what ARM used to do in the very beginning. They, they now do this, right? Of course, this is problematic because now you do a read and you think you're getting something that you, you know, you think you're, you're getting that one field, but you're getting a bunch of other crap. The, uh, the alternative is to actually do, uh, just re reject the, the, uh, the request. Like, you try to read something that's not word aligned, we actually deny the, the load operation and we throw back an error. Um, so, right, so again, modern, system, modern CPUs, or not modern, but like the more common CPUs that you're gonna encounter in the wild will be doing this. Uh, I don't know who, who actually does this anymore. This is mostly like in super small embedded devices, like low power things, which again, like, you're not going to be probably building a full-fledged database system to do this. Right? You, actually, SQLite would, would probably run on these guys. And, it, and of course, it's, it, they've already checked with these things. So this is what we care about in our world. And so we obviously don't want to do this, because right, this is going to be slow. So we need a way to resolve this. So how can we make our thing word-aligned? What's an e easy fix? Padding, exactly, yes. So what we'll do here is, again, we know in our data system, we know what the word alignment is for the hardware that we're running on. So as we start now laying out our, our data for our tuples, we will recognize, oh, well, I can store 64-bit words. This guy's 32 bits. This next one was 64 bits. So rather than spanning the word boundary, I'll just put in a bunch of zeros for these 32 bits to pad it out so that the next attribute starts exactly at the, at the, at the beginning of the next word. All right? And so now in the, in the upper layers of the system, depending on how you give back data to the execution engine, you could, the storage manager could say, all right, well, you need these fields. I don't want to send you a bunch of garbage, so let me go ahead and now stitch this back together in a memory buffer and hand it back to you. Um, or you have to have now your execution to be aware of the padding going on in, in your storage manager so that you know when, when you need to jump to the customer date field that you have to skip over these, these 32 bits that are just padding. What's another thing we could do? Possible to like rearrange the fields? Perfect, yes, reordering. That's the other one, yes. So, uh, 
we, we could also basically run the same thing of like a bin packing problem, where we say, I have 32 bits I can store here to fill out my word. Instead of actually just storing things in the order that they were defined when I created the table, could I just find another 32-bit thing or 32-bit attribute and stick it in there? And then now I could pack the rest, and only here do I have to pad it out to make sure that the next tuple behind me follows at, at, at the right boundary of the word. Right? So again, the upper levels of the system need to be aware of that this padding is going on, or you need to do, do some copying to hide it, hide it from it. So we actually do both in our current system today. Um, and so just to give you an idea of what improvement you can get, so this is a micro benchmark that the, one of the, the students that helped build out the, 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 the new version of the system uh, two summers ago, this is the first implementation we ever did without any alignment. And so this is just doing a, uh, doing a micro benchmark that tries to insert as fast as possible. And so if you don't do any alignment, uh, then you can run at maybe like 400 megabytes a second. You can insert 400 megabytes of data or 500 megabytes of data uh, per second. Um, no, sorry, not, not, sorry, 500 kilobytes, yes. But then if you do padding, then this bumps up to 11 megabytes per second. But if you do padding plus sorting, now everything is, is nicely cache aligned and you can, you can insert at a very high rate. So this is just how fast can we insert in things into memory. This is not writing lo any log records out the disk. Like this is just showing the, you know, the performance advantages you get from this. I don't think we have numbers that show you know, uh, just what sorting provides you. Uh, we only have padding plus sorting. So what happens in our current system is that when you create the table, again, we run this little algorithm that does basically tries to, to figure out the optimal uh, uh, ordering of columns in, in the system. The execution engine is aware of these, this ordering. This is what the projected column stuff gives you. But then before we hand back the result to the application, we make sure that we put it back in the right order as specified by, by this create table statement. I think the SQL standard specifies that you have to do this. Right, so now if someone calls select star, they will get the tuples, the attributes for each tuple ordered as they defined here. Right, because what happens a lot of times, people write their application uh, when they, you know, they have these select star queries, and then when they access attributes, they access them based on offsets, like give me the first one, the second one, the third one. So if I now start shuffling the order of these things because I ran some bin packing algorithm, then that's going to break programs. So we do an extra step to make the life easier for, for the end user. So any questions about this? OK. So now let's talk about storage models. So the, the storage model specifies how the, the database management system is going to organize the tuples and their attributes uh, internally in, in storage. So the, there's the two main approaches are the, the, the NRA, NRA storage model and the decomposition storage model. So this is the row store. This is the column store. Um, and then there's a hybrid approach that we'll talk about a little bit where you sort of have to try to get the best of both worlds right, it, in a single unified system. So the, the row store and assembly approach is what you, people normally think about when we talk about uh, databases, relational databases. Right? And the idea here is, is, like I did in all the examples I showed so far, with all the attributes for a single tuple will be uh, stored contiguously in some region of memory and then only when we get to the last attribute, then, does, then the next tuple begins. So now, again, if I want to go access the third attribute for the fifth tuple, I know how to do that uh, uh, address arithmetic to jump to the offset at the beginning point of that tuple, and then jump to uh, that attribute. So this storage model is, is ideal for transactional workloads or OLTP workloads because in, these, in this environment, the transactions or the queries are... are only going to touch a small number of tuples, and they typically also touch all of the attributes of a tuple. Like there's a lot of st select star queries where account name equals Andy. And I want all the attributes, and therefore, if it's stored in, as a row store, I can just jump to that one region of memory, scan across, and get all the attributes that I need, and then hand it back to the execution or whoever else needs it. This is also where you're typically going to use the tuple at a time iterator model. And we will discuss this more in a few weeks, but basically how we're going to have the execution engine access tuples. Uh, this approach is ideal because, again, I'm just jumping to the starting location of every single tuple and handing back that chunk of memory to wh whatever operator executor ne needs it. Right? This is also going to be really good for insert-heavy workloads, which is 
more, com which is you know what you see a lot in transactional workloads. Like every single time I log in, I insert a new record to say this is when this person logged in. Every time I place a new order on Amazon, I insert a new order record. I insert all the items that I bought. So in, in a row store, this is this is super fast because I can just jump to some memory location or some free slot in my table and just write out contiguously all the attributes. So everything I've, I've already said before. Uh, the advantage of it is fast for inserts and updates and deletes. Go for queries that need the entire tuple. Um, this one we, we, we can ignore for now. Um, but where this is going to be problematic for is when you do analytical workloads where you want to scan large segments of the table and you only want a subset of the attributes. Like if I want to compute what is the most, uh, what was the average price of, of an item bought from anybody who lives in the city of Pittsburgh, I only need to access you know, the city field and the, the price that they bought the uh, some item for, I don't need all the other attributes for, for that tuple. So therefore, if I'm doing a row store, then that's going to be uh, wasteful because I'm going to be accessing chunks of memory that I don't actually need. And I have to keep jumping over and over again to find the right offset of the attribute that I want for every single tuple. So this is what the column store or the, or the DSM approach uh, solves. And the idea here is that for a single attribute in a tuple, we're going to store, uh, store all the values for every single tuple contiguously in memory. Now, it might, just, it might not be for an you know, entire block of data. It might just not have all the, the just the, the values for that single attribute. We could have all the attributes together, but internally, they're always, always going to be stored as a column store. So this is great for read-only queries because you're going to scan over large portions of the, of, of the table at a time, but only accessing a subset of the attributes. All right, so this is the stuff we've already covered. So we'll get better compression through a column store. That will cover on Wednesday. Um, and for, for point queries and updates, this becomes now more expensive potentially because now you have to take the tuple that you need to insert or update and break it apart into its individual attributes and do multiple memory writes to update all of them. So the history of, of column stores is kind of interesting. Um, so column stores are super common now. Like any new OLAP system that's been developed or released in the last 10 years, in the last decade, will be using a column store. If they're not, then they're, they're they don't know what they're doing, and it's not worth your time to talk to, talk to them, right? Um, but it, what, you know, what seems sort of obvious now wasn't always the case. So back in the, in the 1970s, the first implementation, the known implementation of a column store system was this thing called Cantor that came out of the Swedish de Defense Division. It wasn't actually a database system as we know it today. It was more like this sort of batch processing system, but it would organize the data as columns. In the 1980s, there was an actual paper, paper that formalized the idea of what a column store database looks like. But the first sort of known implementation was Sybase IQ, um, which came out, it was an in-memory accelerator for Sybase. The idea was you had your regular Sybase ASC database system, and then you bought Sybase IQ to sit in front of it. So if analytical queries show up, they would run, they would run on that copy of the data. So they were using what is called a fractured mirror approach, which I'll cover in a few more slides. But basically you still had the row store and then this thing sat in front of it and made the analytical queries go faster. I've heard some horror stories about this in the 1990s that it was hard, it never worked co correctly. Um, but th this, it's still around today. And this is what, this is what they were using, uh, you can connect to with an SAP HANA. In 2000s, this is when the column store idea really took off. The three main ones in the space were Vertica, VectorWise, and MoneyDB. VectorWise was an improved in-memory version of MoneyDB. This later got renamed, or got bought by Actian, and then got renamed to Vector, and it's still around today. And this is actually still really good if you benchmark it it does still really well. Um, there's certain aspects of VectorWise that we'll cover later on in, in the semester. Um, MoneyDB is still around as well. They are, it came out of CWI, the same sort of uh, school that built DuckDB. Right? These guys sort of were early in this space as well. And like I said, now everyone recognizes the advantages of a column store and they're, they're widespread. All right, so the paper I had you guys read um, the reason why I chose it because it was sort of showing you that how to do updates and support hybrid workloads on a column store, right? So in our system, we still support transactions. We still support uh, doing updates and as well as also doing analyticals, analytical operations, but we're designed to be a column store. And so this particular paper on a system called Casper was meant to show you how you could still maintain a column store and still get good support for uh, o to be ex execution. So the paper discusses uh, some high-level design decisions you need to be mindful about when you're building a column store system. Tuple identification is how to find uh, tuples in the fixed-length data array. 
how actually are you going to organize the, the data that you're storing in your columns, and then the update policy and buffer location. We sort of already covered these a little bit when we talked about MPCC. It's basically telling where do you, if you, if you have a Delta store, where do you actually store these things, right? And then how do you, how do you apply them later? So I want to focus on the, on the first two. Um, and this is also, uh, and then we'll then talk about how you, the different approaches for building a hybrid store where you have a row store plus a column store. So Casper is a pure column store that supports transactions, but then we'll talk about things like uh, the fracture mirror approach for storing row stores and column stores together. So the first issue is that we need to figure out how we're actually going to identify our tuples, or how, how can we get to the starting location for an attribute. Again, we assume that all the values uh, will be fixed length. The varchar stuff is stored in a variable length data pool, but, but at least the pointer itself will be fixed length. And so if everything's always the same length, then you don't need to actually store any additional information to identify what tuple you're looking at. You just use the implicit offset of where you're looking at in memory to say this is the identifier for the tuple. So if I want the, the second tuple, uh, or, the, or the, the tuple number two in my table, I know how to do the arithmetic to say, well, what is the each type of each of these columns? And I want this location, so I know how to multiply the size of the attribute versus the, the, the starting location I want to jump into, to get the values of this tuple. And I can do the same thing for all the other columns. In some systems, however, they can't do this or they don't want to do this, and instead they actually store implicit or explicitly the tuple identifier for every single attribute that you're storing in a column store. So for column A, right, for the first tuple, I'll store its tuple ID, and the second tuple, I store its tuple ID, and so forth. And this is sort of like a bastardized version of a column store because you're not getting all the advantages of, of doing the fixed point of arithmetic. You're just wasting extra space to store this. Yes? But the offsets are still fixed, even if you store... His question is, are the offsets still fixed? I think so. But like, that won't make sense. Why? So I think Oracle used to do this because they were sort of grafting on a... a, a a poor man's column store into the system, right? They were trying to keep the row store execution engine, but, but operate on columns, so they had to embed these extra things. In the newer versions of the column store, they don't do this. Everyone does, does this, but some systems actually do do this. But it's, it's, it's a bad idea. You don't, like, if you have everything fixed length, then you don't need to. Yes? If you want to like, sort a column, do you still need this ID? So this question is, if you need to sort your columns, you still need these IDs, We'll get to that in, a, in, a, in a two, two more slides. But yeah, so like, if I sort the column, mm, sorry, um, if I sort the column here, uh, I could just sort A and not affect B, C, and D, assuming I have a way to, like for a given tuple identifier to jump to that exact offset for each column. I think this, this is why Oracle did it. Vertica does sorting where when you sort one column, that then cascades to all the other columns. So that going across horizontally, like, at least my, my illustration here, you're, you're looking at the exact same tuple. Most systems don't, don't do that pre-sorting, though. All right, actually, this is, this is, this is the next, next topic. All right, so the next question is, how are we actually going to organize uh, data when we have to make changes or add, add new entries? So the most common one is to do insertion order. So we just find any slot that's free in our, in our blocks, and we just insert our, our tuple in there. So there's no locality, there's no ordering of the attributes. Uh, it's just sort of, it's sort of random. It doesn't, you don't necessarily always have to go in, like from beginning to end. In our system, we actually, uh, we do a compare and swap on a random location in a bitmap and try to find the first free location, which may not be the first free slot, uh, but at least in that case, you know, you're not having threads all try to contend inserting to the same location at the same time. The other approach is what he was referring to is when you, if you insert the tuples into the, 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 the columns based on some ordering scheme. And it's again, Vertica is the most famous one that does this. But this is going to be problematic. We'll see in the next slide because if, if now I have a bunch of inserts showing up and I need to enforce that ordering, I don't want to pay the penalty of having to reshuffle things every single time because that, that would be expensive. And then the last approach is from the Casper paper, where you're going to uh, break up the blocks into ranges and according to some, some partitioning scheme. And then within each block, it doesn't need to be sorted, but sort of globally, there's this, what they call a shallow index, at least will jump you to the location that will have the, the data that, that, that you're looking for within a particular range. So let's look at the first one. So this is just insertion order. 
So this is my column store. Uh, I want to start this tuple. So I just find whatever the first free slot is for my tuple, uh, my new tuple, and I just add my entry there. Right? It's easy. And when this thing gets full, then I create a new block and just keep inserting, inserting into that. So then now, if I want to do the sorted uh, table, the, say I take all these columns and I, and I sort them according to the scheme. So I'm going to first sort A, for sort all the tuples by A ascending, then by B descending, and then by C ascending. So again, we need to have the fixed length offset for every single tuple be the same. So if I'm looking at for tuple four, right, I want to be able to jump into B at this location and I should see the attribute for B for the same tuple. So now if I, if I sort, say I want to sort on A, I have to then propagate that sort order over to, to the other columns. Right, so, so I start with A, I sort these by this value, but now within, for B, right, I'm going to see, here's all the attributes of B sorted, uh, sorry, all the attributes with A equals 1, and now I sort them according to my, my sort order for, for, B, for B, and then within that I have now the sort ordering within C. So again, now this guarantees that, again, if I'm looking at this, this tuple here, I'm going across and I'm seeing the, 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 all the attributes for my given tuple. Let me take you guys why you want to do the sorting. Yes. Secondary indices. She says secondary in indices. Uh, what do you mean? Like if you wanted to jump to a place in column B, um, you, you can sort it on multiple. So you said if I jump to a certain place on column B, but 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 here, in this case here, I sorted on A, right? So so if I have a predicate that says find me all the tuples where A equals A equals A one, then I can just jump to this and scan down, and then once I see A2, I know there's never going to be another A1, and I'm done. But in case of B, if I find me all the tuples where B equals B2, I can't just look in this region. I actually got to scan the whole thing. Yeah, but you know that once you've found, like, within that small region, once you've found the next thing. Right, so, so she's saying, well, once I get here, so I'm looking for B2. Once I get here, now I see a B1. I know there's not going to be another B1 for this region of A, and then now, but now I need to know how to jump to the next region of A. I think what she's saying is you can have better cache locality on secondary indexes because you can have more of that. Like, unless you're trying to find all the values between B1 and B2, you have a secondary index built on that or something like that, right? You can just, like, you grab all the ones from B1 on the first chunk, you grab the second chunk of B1, then you grab the first chunk of B2, you grab the second chunk of B2, and those are all relatively grouped in, together. I see what you're saying. So it's not really a secondary index, so it would make the scan go faster, right? But my, like, Assuming this is, if you're doing partition, right, if you know what the boundaries are, so if I, if I, this is the boundary for A, for A, A equals A, A equals A1. So if I scan, I'm looking for all the B2s, if I scan the B2 and then I see the B1, I know there's never going to be another B2 after this, so then if I knew what the next partition is, I could just jump down here. That, that, that's, 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 yeah, that'd be the one benefit, yes. I was going to say the other thing too, is like it essentially kind of produces an index in the, System. For for B though. Well, for A. For A, yes. Yeah. So we'll see this actually. The, the the answer I was looking for. We'll see this on Wednesday. We're actually going to be able to compress this way better if everything's sorted. So the most common one common kind of sorting you can do is called run length encoding. So say like this only we only have two values for B. It's B two or B one. So instead of sorting copies of B two over and over again, I can say I have B two twice, two times. And I have B1, you know, one time, two times, three times, right? This is, like, think of, like, male, female, assuming that you just have two, two, two sexes. Everybody is either one or the other. So if I have a million students, you know, if I sort them on, on, on their sex, then I can say, here's, here's you know, 500,000 males and 500,000 females. And I just need to store just that, that, that small encoding, not every single instance of the value. We'll see this next class. Um, so Vertica does this. Vertica is the, most, the strongest proponent of doing uh, sorting. They call these projections. Right? The idea is that I sort everything on A, uh, and then within the boundary of a value of A, then I sort to the next column and so forth. That's sort of, you're narrowing the, the window. Okay. That actually is their index. They don't... Yeah, they, yeah, yeah, Vertica does not have any B plus three indexes. They only have sorted projections. All right, so now if I, the problem is going to be if I keep everything globally sorted like this, if now I want to insert this guy here, well, he wants to go, this new attribute wants to go in this position here, but there's some other attribute, there's some other tuple being stored there now. And in my case here, A2 is less than A3, but I'm sorting on A, 
So I need to move these guys down before I can go ahead and insert my tuple. Right? And that would obviously be expensive to do on the fly if I have a billion tuples and my guy lands at the beginning of my column. If I have to shift everything over, or even within a block, this would be expensive to do. And this is what the Casper one is trying to solve. So the idea is that you're going to have this index above uh, your, 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 your columns, and then you're going to split things into these partitions based on ranges. And then now what will happen is when I do an insert, I just need to make sure that my, my tuple I'm trying to insert lands into the right range. It doesn't need to be sorted within that range. As long as I have space, then I can put it right in there. Um, and then now I can easily find all the data that I, that I want when I'm, doing, uh, when I'm doing, trying to do point queries. If I had to do sequential scans or long scans like an OLAP queries, then I ignore the index and I just, I just rip through the columns anyway. Although you, you can use them to guide, guide the, the scan search. So this is an additional component of Casper where they have this offline algorithm where they're going to examine the workload or examine the, the data set and then try to come up with an optimal partitioning scheme such that for, for, for tuples that are accessed through analytical operations, they have larger partitions because you're not likely going to update them and have to do reshuffle things. And then for the, for the, the, the data that's hot, it's going to be updated very soon, then you want smaller partitions so that the, you can find them more quickly using the shell index. All right, so let's go look at an example here. So again, we have uh, our column store. They have these, log these, these partition markers. They don't have to be physically partitioned. In their example, they show it sort of just seems like a giant contiguous space, and these are just demarcation points. But obviously, you don't want to, you're not going to allocate you know, some giant array, so this is still be organized as blocks. But the important thing to also point out, too, is that these are variable length partitions, and they can grow and shrink based on how the tuples are accessed. So if I want to insert this tuple here, it's going to go into this partition because we're trying to start an A2, and I have space to store A2 right here. That's fine. That's really fast, and we're done. But now if I want to insert this other tuple here, I want to insert another tuple that has A2. Well, that needs to go into this position, but now within my partition, I don't have any more space. So they, they use this technique called ripple insert. The idea is like you, is how I understood it, is like you drop a pebble into a lake, and so you see the ripples propagate. You're going to start moving things around, uh, going, going from one partition to the next. So for this one here, we want to insert our tuple into this one, this partition, but we don't have any space. So we need to steal some space uh, from the partition below us. So we need to move this guy to the end of its partition, and then now I just slide down my, my demarcation point, all right, and readjust my, my, my range partitions and my, my shallow index, and now I, I can insert that tuple. Now it may be the case that when, when we try to uh, move this tuple uh, to a new position, this partition didn't have more space, so therefore we had to go now steal from the next partition and so forth. That, that, that's the sort of ripple effect. But the idea here is, is in best case scenario, I can insert into my partition and I don't have to move anything around. Worst case scenario, I have to reshuffle every single partition. Um, but in practice, right, I don't really say how often it should occur, but like, in practice, like, it, sh it shouldn't have to reorganize the entire database. Certainly way less than we had to do if we were doing that globally inserted thing that I showed in the beginning. Yes? So this is just like sorted based on one attribute only? His claim is, is this like sorting based on one attribute only? No, you can still sort on different attributes. It's just this. Because when you have to like resort B and C too, if you're resorting like on all attributes like the previous example. The statement is, wouldn't I have to resort on B and C if I'm sorting on multiple attributes? So yeah, the paper doesn't really give an explanation of this. Uh, this, thing could, this thing could be multi -at multiple attributes. And all it's going to say is this is the range of some, some, this is the range domain that's being represented by a partition. And that could be on multiple attributes, could be on a single attribute. Within a partition, though, I don't have to re resort things. Okay. Or, sorry, I, I'm, not, I'm not keeping these things sorted. Oh, it's just like. This is just telling you, hey, the data you're looking for is going to be in this range, but when you land here, go figure out where it is. Okay, yeah. And again, if it's OLTP, then I don't want this thing to be huge, because then I've got to scan a bunch of columns to find exactly what I wanted. But if my, my, if my partition is bounded, uh, to most, if, my, if my partition is smaller, then the probability I'm going to find what I need, uh, it, it, it'll be faster because there's less data to look at. Again, they have this offline algorithm to kind of to resize these things based on how things are being accessed. Okay, so I've already said this, but I just want to sort of reiterate again. In, for these HTAP workloads, for these hybrid workloads, there's going to be this dichotomy between hot data and cold data. The hot data are things that just, were just recently inserted, just recently updated, and just recently accessed through an OTP transaction. And then you had the rest of all this cold data, which are things that 
we need them there to do scans and analytics on, but it's very unlikely that we're going to have to go ahead and update them. So if we are aware of this, and this is what the, the Casper thing is, is trying to exploit, then instead of just maybe just resizing partitions, we could also reorganize or store the data in different ways, such that the, the hot data is in a row store, because that'll be faster for, for transactions. And over time, as it cools off, we move it to a column store, because that's where we want to store our cool data. So this is what the hybrid storage model approach is. So I would say that also upfront about this, this is how we originally did Peloton. This is what I thought used to be the, the, the right idea. I actually, I, I actually now think that the pure column store, whether you're doing the Casper approach or the, the, the hyper approach that we do, that's actually the better way to go. It's not worth the engineering overhead to have this, all this, these, these extra storage managers in place to, to make this work. But you should at least know how it works, because a lot of systems actually do this. So the idea is that we're going to have a single logical database instance where underneath the covers, we're going to store our hot and cold data differently. So I call create table, and anytime I do a lookup, I see one table, but underneath the covers, the database system is managing different, uh, is managing different tu the tuples differently. So again, the, the hot data will be in the row store, the cold data will be in the column store. So there's two approaches to do this from an engineering pr perspective. The first is that you actually maintain two completely separate execution engines and a storage manager in your system, and then you have something that stitched together the answer up above. Right? And then the other approach is what we did in Peloton, is that you have a single execution and a single storage manager that can operate on both row store and column store data at the same time. Right? That you have this sort of indirection layer that knows how to read the data from the two different uh, models and can unify them in a single engine. So the separate execution engine is the most common one, because what mostly happens here is that people take two existing database systems and they slap them together and they build a little middleware thing on top of that to, to unify them. Um, so the, the two ways to do this would be the fraction mirrors, which is the, uh, what Oracle and IBM are doing, um, and then the delta store approach is what HANA used to do, where that sort of looks like the, when we talked about the time travel table, remember they had like the, the main data table and the time travel table and the main data table always had the oldest one and the time travel table had the, the latest one. That's because the main table was the column store and then the, uh, the, the, the time travel table was the delta store. So I'll, I'll go through, through both of these. So the fraction mirror one is again, we basically have a complete copy of, of the database, but now stored is a column store. Right? So it's like a mirrored copy, but it's called fractured, meaning like I broke the mirror because I reorganized the, the rows now to be a columns. So the row store will always be the primary storage of the database. All my reads and writes are going to go here. All my transactions will update this portion. And then in the background through some process, I will then copy the data out, convert it to a column store, and store it in the mirror. And then now when any analytical query shows up, if they only need to touch data that is bounded within the, the column store, then I can route it over here. And it'll, and it'll, it'll run more efficiently. Yes? So this data can be stale, a bit stale, right? His question is, or statement is, this data could be a bit stale. Depends. So sometimes you can, and sometimes, sometimes you want to, and sometimes you don't, have to, you don't, you don't want to do this. So if, you, if it can't be stale, then when an analytical query shows up, you need to recognize, oh, well, you need data that I don't have in, in the column store yet, so I need, also need to execute that query on the, on the, the row store and then put it, put it back together. So Oracle does this. So they, they decide whether they want it to run a query on the transaction level and then do the... It's, it's, it's more like they figure out what portion of the query needs to run on the, the row store and what portion needs to run on the column store. And they'll run them both and then put it all together. Sybase IQ didn't, uh, as far as I know, didn't do that. It, it, it was sort of separate from the row store. You couldn't, it didn't know, it didn't know about the row store other than getting updates from it. So when an analytical, if you ran an analytical query on Sybase IQ, it would only touch this. It wouldn't go back and get the rest of the data from this. Whereas Oracle, Oracle combines everything. But like, staleness can be fine, right? In what real life example? I, I, so, so, so his statement is, staleness is okay. I think he brought this up earlier. Like, in what scenario would you need to have, like, you know, Serializable execution of an analytical query with up-to-date information. People, people want that. It's a, it's a, people want enough that Oracle decided to do it. But the important thing to point out, though, in the case of Oracle's case, uh, for their in-memory uh, uh, column store, which the guy will be talking about on Wednesday, 
This thing is ephemeral. So like if this thing, if you crash and, and, and come back or stop the system and turn it back on, like it'll re-propagate the, 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 the column store by reading from the row store. So, so again, all the updates have to go here. This is the primary storage. This thing is propagated uh, lazily. Yes? So his question is, is MemSQL doing this? No, MemSQL would do the, the Delta store approach. Um, and so the way this one works is that, um, again, you have this like Delta store, it's like a, a row store, I think like, there was a pending uh, like update, so a log, right? And then over, t actually, the newer version of MemSQL might do this, the old version doesn't. The newer version does this, the old version didn't. The old version is that you call create table and you would say, I want to be a row store or a column store. But then if you say, all right, I want to make this table now be a row store, or sorry, if it, if it started off as a row store, I want to now make it a column store, I got to dump it out and load it back in, right? So like I couldn't take the data from a row store table and have it seamlessly converted to a column store. I had to have two separate logical tables. The newer version actually does this, where you apply the updates to this Delta store, and then they're appended to the, the column store, right? Um, so... Again, this, you have the same issue that we had on the fractured mirrors. If now I have a query that needs to touch data on both sides, uh, then I need a way to execute on the row store plus the column store. The, um, now, if you're doing MVCC, you sort of, like with the Delta store, you kind of get the same thing for free. Like you already need to be able to traverse back in the version chain and find the right version of a given tuple. And that essentially becomes the same thing as the Delta store. It's just we're going from, in our system, we're doing newest to oldest rather than oldest to newest. So when we go look in our column, that's always the newest version. But we still have a way to go back and reconcile the right older version by, by replaying updates in the Delta store. But some of the, some of like the old Deltas, would, would they be like flushed to the disk? In MemSQL or just in general? MemSQL. For MemSQL? Uh, his, his statement is, in MemSQL, are these things ever flushed out the disk? As far as I know, n no, other than the log. Right? But that's, that's separate from this. So the... The reason I brought up that, that, so that, that, that MVCC stuff is like, in this, going back to, the, to this case here, the fractured mirrors, you basically build two database systems. You need one that, that operates on row store data, and then you need a, a, a column store one. Like you need an execution engine that knows how to efficiently operate on, on you know, columnar data, because that's going to be different than how you do things in a row store data. So you're basically maintaining two separate engines. This one here is a little less work, uh, because again, if you're doing MVCC, you still need to, you, you need to how to handle this anyway. Um, this is actually, I think, the better approach. Uh, you know, whether or not the, the, the MVCC approach that we're doing now is, is the same thing, but whether this is constitute a full, in our system, where the delta chains, the version chains constitute a full delta store, that's debatable. I think this is just semantics. But I think this is the better approach because now you're not having this engineering monstrosity of trying to maintain two separate database systems together. Right? So with Peloton, what we did was we were trying to be clever. And we were trying to have uh, both a row store and a column store together, but then we have an execution engine above that that knew how to operate on both of them. And we did this by having this abstraction layer that we called tiles that knew how to just operate on these tiles and didn't know underneath the covers whether it was a row store or a column store. And then the access methods for accessing tiles of a different type knew how to put things together or access them efficiently. So again, the idea was that uh, we would look at our data uh, see how the, tr the transactions and analytical queries were accessing them, recognize which regions were hot, which regions were cold. We take the hot data, store it as a, as a row store, and then take the cold data and store it as a, as a column store. And then now, again, when I execute queries, I, I, I know how to you know, put things together as needed. So I'm, I'm going to show one graph of how, how this works. Basically, everything always starts out as a row store, right? So if you're doing a bunch of... Uh, uh, if you're doing a workload where you're going to do scans, insert, scans, insert, so it's basically OLAP, OTP, OLAP, OTP, so forth. So with the row layout, the scans will be slower, the, the inserts will be faster. If you're doing a columnar layout, the, um, the, sorry, the, the scans are faster, but the inserts are slower, because now I'm breaking up a tuple and, and storing it to multiple locations. And the idea with the hybrid layout was everything starts off as a row store, but then over time, as as you start doing more scans and the data gets colder, it gets converted to a column store, and then now that speeds up the scan operations. So the rows are just, just as fast as a row store because it is a row store, but then the scans get faster. So we ditched all this because it was an engineering nightmare, 
and uh, the, I mean, one, students couldn't understand what the hell we were actually doing, uh, but then, like, having to write uh, test cases and, and performance regressions for this hybrid thing was, was became a huge, huge, became a big problem for us. So we ditched all this, kept it more simple, and just went with, with a clean column store. I think that's actually the better approach. And whether you have the shallow index that the, uh, the Casper guys are doing above that, that's debatable. I don't like the idea of having um, additional background, uh, background mechanisms to go and try to reorganize data for you by looking at the workload. I think that should also be centralized. And for this implementation, we didn't have that yet. Okay? All right, so that was kind of rushed at the end. But like, the, the main takeaway, again, is like, you could, there's a bunch of different ways to, to, to do row stores and column stores together. I argue that, at least for the workloads that we're looking at, I think a pure column store is the way to go with MVCC. Uh, but a lot of times you're going to encounter the fractured mirror approach. So that's, that's pretty common for all the, big, uh, the major vendors. Okay? All right. Uh, I want to quickly talk about catalogs. So um, we're not going to have time to do demos, but catalogs are super interesting. Remember, we've been talking about this at the very beginning, like how do we figure out the layout of a tuple? How do we know how to jump to different offsets? Well, when you call create table, we store the metadata that you specified when you created that table in a catalog. And then when we go access the tuple, we we'll read the catalog and figure out, all right, what is the layout of, of our data? So the tricky thing about catalogs, though, is that we actually want to eat our own dog food, meaning we don't want to have a separate database to maintain just to store our catalog. We want to store the, the, t the catalog in our own database, or right, in our own tables. But now it's like a chicken for the egg problem. Like, I need to store metadata about tables uh, in the catalog, but I need to store my catalog in tables, right? So we have to have the specialized code in order to bootstrap the catalogs. Uh, the Postgres one is actually kind of interesting. They take the, they basically have this DSL that then convert into C, C, C code. Uh, for, for doing this bootstrapping, basically inserting all the things you need to have to, in order for the catalogs to turn on. Uh, I'm not aware what other systems do, because I, I can actually see the source code in, in Postgres. Um, in the earlier versions of MySQL, like MySQL 5.7, uh, they just stored the, the catalogs as flat files on disk, which I think is, is the wrong thing to do. You want to store everything in, in, as regular tables, because now you get all the asset guarantees that you would expect for regular tuples in, in data tables. So. Let's go through some examples of how to do schema changes. And you'll see now how some things will be easier if you're a row store and some things will be harder if you're a column store and vice versa. So if I add a column, then uh, I basically need to scan through every single tuple if I'm a row store and copy the tuple into a new location and with, insert it with the, the new column in it. Some database systems don't let you insert the column into any location. Like you can only insert it, insert it at the end. Like Postgres does this. Um, so since it's like MySQL, you can specify exactly where you want, it, where you want to insert it. Because basically what they're doing is they're copying every single tuple from the old schema to the new schema. For, for a column store, potentially it's super easy. Yes, question. You, you, you did this, sorry. Oh, sorry. For column store is super easy because I just make a new column, right? And I don't need to modify any of the other columns. Now it depends how I'm organizing my blocks. Uh, but in general, it's, you know, it, it, this is way easier than a, than a row store because I don't have to touch any existing data. For drop columns, same thing. Well, if I'm going to go and take the, the, the column out to, to save memory, uh, then I, again, go through every single tuple and copy it over. In some systems, you can just mark them as deprecated. Like Postgres will do this. If I drop a column, it doesn't actually get dropped. It just records in the catalog that it's been dropped. You know to ignore it if any query comes along and tries to read it. But physically, it's still there. And then at some point, when they run the garbage collector for MVCC, they'll go ahead and compact it. For column store, again, if I'm storing my columns as uh, separately in memory, uh, then I just go ahead and just free it up, and I'm done. And it don't, doesn't affect anybody else. Change column, uh, like if you change the column type uh, or change constraints on the column, depending on what the change I'm doing, I may have to scan through and look at every single tuple before I can make that change. Again, and depending on whether I'm a row store or a column store, I could leave the, the data as it exists, or I could uh, I had to go change things. Like if I go from a 32-bit integer to a, to a uh, 16-bit integer, I have to scan through to make sure that I'm not going to have uh, uh, out-of-bound errors if I do that change. But 
now maybe I don't need to actually copy everything and make a 16-bit column. I can leave it as 32 bits. Some later point, I clean it up, but uh, you know the, the conversion is just sort of done at a logical level. Indexes are super tricky. Uh, this one, I don't think we have time to discuss this semester. This is, I will say, this is something that people have tried for, uh, I think, for two years now in this class. We've tried to always do create indexes. Um, we can create indexes now. Like in our system, if you call create index before you load any table data in the table, that's fine. The when you insert data, then we'll update the index. It's going through and populating an index on an already created table. That's when things get tricky. Because if you want to do this without blocking inserts, because I, I I could just lock the whole table, scan it, populate my, my index, but you know that could take a long time. So I want to, There's ways to do uh, populations of indexes without having to block everything uh, while you do this. And this is something that people have tried two times in this class with Nick's success. Uh, I think it'd be fun to be able to try this uh, this semester again. Drop index is super easy, right? You just drop it logically from the catalog. Then in the background, at some point, you, you know that nobody else is looking at it, and you go ahead and drop this. And this, we have this deferred event framework in our system now that does garbage collection for any kind of memory we allocate in the system, and we can handle this already. Right? Uh, the last one it will be sequences. And so sequences are auto-increment numbers, um, or like the serial key in Postgres. Think of like a column. I have an attribute where every time I insert a tuple, if I don't specify a value, there's some counter where they're going to add one to it. And then that way, if the next tuple gets inserted, it'll have you know, the counter plus one and so forth. And so what's super interesting about them is that they don't follow the same transactional guarantees or, and isolation protections that you get from regular transactions. Right? We're going to store them in the catalog, this counter. But if I insert a tuple, the counter gets increased, and then I roll back my transaction, the tuple will get rolled back, but the counter always still goes up. And so what needs to happen is you actually have to log that to disk because that way if I crash and come back, I need to know where that counter left off, even though the transaction that modified it may have not get written, gotten written to disk. So this is actually something that students did do in the old system, which was a lot of fun, and I think this, this would be good to, uh, to do again in this class. Right? There's obviously optimizations we could look at from like Postgres and other systems, like maybe you only update the counter uh, on disk for every, you know, for a batch of values, like every 10, write that to disk, then you hand out new values in memory, and then only when you hit, hit, you hit the upper bound, then you increment the, the counter in the catalog again. Okay? Uh, we're out of time, so I, I can't do a demo, but uh, we, we can do it after class if you're interested in this kind of stuff. All right, so to, just to finish up. So as I said, we abandoned the hybrid storage model. I think simplicity, for, at least for this case, is this part of the system is a, uh, is a big win and the right way to go. Um, the, the delta versioning we would use under MVCC plus a column store is equivalent to sort of the, the, the different approaches that we saw before. Catalogs are really hard. This is actually something we got right in our system now. I'm actually happy to say this. Um, we followed the Postgres schema or the layout of catalogs. Um, and, but everything's stored as tables, so we, we get things, we get all the transactional guarantees you, you would normally get for regular tuples. So there's a lot of cool things we can do now that our, our catalogs are transactional. But we'll, we'll, we can cover that more when we talk about project three. Okay? Any questions? Bank it in the side pocket. What is this? Some old bullshit. Hey, yo, hey, yo. What? Took a sip and had to spit, cause I ain't with that beer called the OE, cause I'm OG. Ice Cube, down with the STI. You looked and it was gone. Grab me a 40. Cause I needed just a little more kick Hook like a fish after just one sip Yo. Put it to my lips and rip the top off A ball just dropped off Cause ain't eyes hopped off And my hood won't be the same After Ice Cube take a say I to the brain yeah.